This is an interview with Dr. Sangeeta Bhatia for the MIT 150 Infinite History Project. Professor Sangeeta Bhatia is the John and Dorothy Wilson Professor of Electrical Engineering and Health Sciences and Technology. She joined the MIT faculty in 2005 and her work focuses on tissue repair and regeneration using micro and nanotechnology with a specific focus on developing improved cellular therapies for liver disease and cancer nanotechnology. Among her several advanced degrees, she earned her Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering and a PhD in Medical Engineering here at MIT. Thank you for speaking with us, Professor Bhatia. It's my pleasure. So let's get started by talking a little bit about your background in terms of your upbringing, your family background, and where you're from. Okay, well I was born here in Boston and um, my parents came over from India in the 60s. They were actually originally refugees at the time of uh, the partition of India and Pakistan in 1947. And they made their way over here for a better life, for a higher education. And um, they really encouraged me very early on to uh, pursue math and science and um, to sort of reach for the stars. And their status as having been refugees, what did you take away from that? What lessons did you learn from your parents and their experiences? Well, I think they, um, they really believed that education was an important part of success in life, uh, both to open your mind and to achieve the lifestyle that you want for you and your family. And um, both of their families really believed in the education of women. Um, which was not, which was somewhat unusual at the time. Um, my mother was actually one of the first MBAs in all of India. Um, so they were always happy and, and encouraging of us uh, to pursue um, the very best education. They um, also were very resourceful as a result and very hardworking and believed a lot in entrepreneurship. My father was a serial entrepreneur, is a serial entrepreneur. Um, so they've always thought a little bit outside of the box and really encouraged me to take risks. Um, not always follow the rules. <laughs> and what was your father's educational, uh, early educational training? So he's also an engineer. Um, and uh, he then went on to get um, study business. Um, but he was the one actually who saw in me that I should be an engineer and I think I didn't realize when I was in high school what an engineer was, and that's so, so common. Even nowadays, you won't hear in the dialogue of school children um, that they, at least American school children, that they like to be engineers. They don't really have, a, I think, a strong sense of how much engineering impacts all of our lives, that it's, that it's inside your smartphone that, um, or the rocket to the moon or whatever um, new gadget that they're playing with. They don't think about the engineering behind it, and I certainly was the same. So um, when my father suggested that I be an engineer, you know, I took it obviously into consideration, but I think I didn't even know what it was until I was halfway through my engineering degree. <laughs> and what subjects early on interested you in school that you remember, and did certain courses stick with you? Um, so I really was... Uh, struck by my biology class in ninth grade. It really captured my imagination. And I had always kind of also been good at math. And so my dad was, as I said, really involved parent and had been reading about this new field of engineering meets biology, which was bioengineering. Um, and that sounded like a great combination to me. I wasn't quite sure what it would mean. Um, so to make it more real, he actually brought me here to MIT to the mechanical engineering department. There was a professor here at the time uh, in the 80s named Professor Lele. And he was a mechanical engineer who was using ultrasound, focused ultrasound, to heat tumors for cancer therapy. And that really captured my imagination as a teenager, the idea that you could make machines, make, make instruments that could affect patient lives. Um, so that kind of got me started. And how did this idea come about, your father taking you to MIT? That's a pretty amazing opportunity for a teenager. Yeah, I think, um, he, I think he and my mom both really took um, our futures on as kind of a family project. Like, let's find out what you're good at, what you love, um, how you're going to make a difference in the world. Um, and he, you know, uh, had a friend who was here and, and brought us here. 
That's amazing. Yeah, I think I think we're really looking back on it, really so so instrumental in um, in me finding my way. And do you have even earlier memories of this interest in science developing? I know there's kind of a, a funny story about you as a child and the family answering machine. <laughs> yeah. So there is a funny story about how I was always kind of the family tinkerer, and I'd like to take things apart just to see how they work or to try and put them back together. And at some point in my childhood, our answering machine broke. It was the old kind of answering machine with uh, an actual tape in it. And um, I took it apart and fixed it and put it back together and had a few parts left over. <laughs> and um, I think uh, I'm sort of, ever since I've been known as kind of the family tinkerer. Were your parents impressed with your early skills? <laughs> you know, they, I think they have always been just really, really supportive and really big fans in general. And uh, we were sort of raised, my sister and I both, with really high expectations. Like we were supposed to, you know, be the best. And if you got a 96 on a math test, then what four did you get wrong? And <laughs> um, so we, we, they had high expectations of us, but they were also really encouraging. So I think um, they didn't say that they were impressed. <laughs> they were impressed. Were those high expectations hard to deal with, or did you already understand from your family's tradition of, of higher education that this was just what you did to push yourself to excel? I mean, I think a little of both. I think we, we, my sister and I grew up knowing that a lot was expected of us and we had sort of the natural teenage rebellion. So my version of that was I think junior year in high school, I wasn't happy with um, my dad's response to my report card and I decided not to show it to him anymore. And I remember sitting him down when I went to college saying, okay, is the big leagues, you know, a C is average, <laughs> trying to sort of get him, prepare him for the next phase. So, um, or, you know, we were always seeking their approval, for sure. W who were some early teachers or mentors who influenced your academic and even your later professional choices, do you think? Well, as I said, certainly um, my father was very encouraging, and then also my mother, she was a real, um, a real rebel in many ways, as I've mentioned. Um, and then when I was in, in college, I met a physician named Moses Goddard. He was doing research in one of the laboratories that I was volunteering in, and he was the very first person to say to me, you should consider getting a PhD. Um, and until that moment in time, it literally just hadn't crossed my mind. Um, I didn't, it wasn't part of kind of my family experience, it wasn't in my life plan. I was going to get a master's degree and I was going to go work in industry. And um, in that moment, I didn't grab onto it, but it sort of planted the seed. And um, years later, it would come up again, and I would realize that it was the right path for me. So he was, he was one of several people in my life who sort of saw more in me than I saw in myself. And I think, I think you really need those, um, those people to push you. So uh, the next one was Mehmet Toner, who was an HST faculty member, is also an MIT alum, and he was my advisor when I was here at MIT. And he was the one who encouraged me to be a professor, actually. And again, it was something I just hadn't even considered. And as I was graduating, he said to me, you should think about it. And um, he's still a great mentor to me, actually. I just saw him yesterday. <laughs> it's nice to keep those relationships going. Yeah, it's, it's really wonderful. Like, as I said, to have people believe in you more than, see more in you than you see in yourself. And you obviously have an incredibly impressive academic record with multiple advanced degrees to a postdoc training at Mass General Hospital. Where, um, the, obviously that drive came largely from your parents, but what did you learn about yourself with each achievement as you went through your illustrious educational journey? Um, what did I learn about myself? I think what I learned, I became more comfortable in my own skin. Um, as I have advanced in my career. I think in the beginning, a lot of my achievements were sort of laced with um, wondering if I, if I could do it, you know, if I belonged, if I was good enough. Um, and at every level, I was, you know, pushed to the limit, especially coming here to MIT. Um, you know, you sort of find yourself amongst more and more elite circles of people the best and the brightest, and um, 
and realizing that you can do it and that you could achieve and that you could arrive at the top of the class, I think, um, you know, gave me a level of, of confidence, um, just being comfortable in my own skin, comfortable with my ideas, so that now, you know, I, I feel I feel confident when I have a new idea or if I'm in a room full of um, people that are brainstorming or if I'm advising a student about which direction to go in a project. I think, um, I think the confidence that I bring to, um, to science comes from those sort of sequential achievements. And what made you want to include MIT in that stellar list of schools um, that, you, uh, that you chose? Was it, was it that early visit in high school that always stuck in your mind? Was it even earlier that you thought that was a place where high achievers go? Yeah, I think, you know, it is hard to sort of place how MIT comes into one's consciousness. I think having grown up here in the Boston area, I feel like I knew about MIT. You know, I can't remember a moment when I didn't know about MIT and thought about it as, you know, the pinnacle of technological innovation and the place that you would go. I think I always kind of thought that I would come here um, for my graduate training. And... Um, I think what I didn't realize uh, as an outsider was the, the, the amount of um, entrepreneurship that also goes on here and how much time and energy we all spend taking our inventions out into the real world. So I knew that it was a place where there was a lot of excellence and a lot of really smart people, um, but I didn't sort of appreciate all the elements of the environment that I do now. And was there anything else about it that was a surprise once you came here versus the kind of mythical perceptions that you had being a, a Boston native? I think, um, I think that we all have perceptions of what it's like to be in a place of such excellence, but the sort of magnitude of the energy and the passion and the round-the-clock work culture, you can't. There's just no way to perceive that from the outside. You really have to, to live at the sort of density of great ideas and great minds. Um, is, is really impossible to appreciate from the outside, I think. And you mentioned that round-the-clock work culture, which MIT is well known for. Um, <laughs> how much of that was a culture shock to you as a student? I know there was some uh, I've read there was a little bit of surprise over the 3 a.m. Saturday nights here. Yeah. But tell me what that was like and how you how tough of an adjustment that was early on. So I think that one thing that a lot of um, a lot of us go through trying to decide whether we want to choose this as a profession, whether it's science or engineering or technological innovation, is is looking at the profession and sort of deciding if it's the right life for you. So whether it's the right way to make the biggest impact as well as all the other pieces of the life you know that you envision for yourself and so when i came here i think part of part of my journey had to do with trying to figure out how if i could still be the best if i could still be the top of the class um, and have the life that i wanted and so i had a moment where i came in to to do an experiment to feed my cells. My liver cells needed daily feeding. It happened to be 3 a.m. Saturday night, and I'd been out, and I walked into lab, and it was literally full of people. It was 3 a.m. on Saturday, and I had this moment where I thought, like, uh-oh. <laughs> I don't think that this is something I want to sign up for permanently. Like, I want to be sleeping at 3 a.m. on Saturday night. Um, so I, I kind of had to make this decision about how how science and engineering were going to fit with the life that I wanted. And what I decided was that I was willing to give a lot of myself to the profession, but not to give everything, and to hold a piece of myself for me um, so that I could have a happy life and a balanced life. And um, I think it was a really important decision for me because graduate school and actually all of life in science is really kind of a marathon. Um, and you have to figure out how to sustain yourself and your spirit. Um, so for me, that was a really kind of pivotal moment to, to recognizing how to, how to not give everything, to not de be depleted. And having made that realization, which probably more people wish they had, did you ever have a moment where you thought that decision either cost you a breakthrough or some achievement or some extra level of success that you would have had if you spent all weekend in the lab? 
I think that I think it is true actually that you give up things, um, and I think you just have to decide. You know what you have to prioritize. So I went on sabbatical a few years ago and sort of thought about what are the things I want to achieve in kind of the next seven years. And I realized that it's really not for me about the awards and um, the academies. I think those are you know, wonderful and important parts of science and engineering. But for me, I really care about touching patients. So I want to make inventions that have a clinical impact or have a technological impact. And so coming back from sabbatical, I decided to spend time on things that maybe aren't always as visible in sort of an awards or publication perspective. But so for me, it's about starting companies or training the next generation of students or inventing something that inspires a new field. Um, and those are all kind of intangibles, but for me personally, they're, they're more motivating. Um, so I do think that you know, if you're not willing to travel 200 days a year and stay up every Saturday night, that you give up some of the awards and some of the publications. And I think the time that you are willing to to commit to your profession, you have to just really focus on the things that you think are going to be meaningful for you. And the decision to s focus on some of those more intangible goals, how has that been received here, you know, at MIT? Well, I think, you know, MIT actually is really broad-minded in what it values. I think that it, we have all kinds of impact here. If you look across the campus, there's basic science impact, there's the media lab, there's software engineering, there's global health. So um, I think that the, it really is pretty resonant with the value system of the campus, not necessarily the academic community internationally. But I think that the MIT sort of ecosystem really does value um, impact. And if you think about what makes us respect another colleague or student, it, it may well be, oh, he or she started this company, which has now you know, touched 20 million lives, um, even if it was never a publication. You were receiving your advanced degrees in the late 90s. Um, what, what was the climate like? even though it was very recently, um, for women pursuing advanced degrees, were there any remaining hurdles that you perceived for women even as recently as that, that era? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I think that there, um, there was a smidge of, uh, of bias, I would say, that I experienced. Um, my very first day here at MIT, actually I was in thermodynamics, and um, before class started, my professor came up to me and asked me if I was in the right class. And I think, you know, I think he was surprised to see me there. There was only two women in the graduate program in mechanical engineering. I think he didn't mean it maliciously, um, but it made me feel uncomfortable and conspicuous. And I think you know, it really wasn't that long ago. There were very few women faculty. Nine percent of the School of Engineering faculty were women, and you know we've made a lot of strides since then. We're up to 16 percent, which is great given the short time. Um, but you know, I didn't have a lot of peers. I didn't have a lot of professors who to look up to, and so um, you know the climate was, I would say, chilly. <laughs> I uh, I've gotten kind of used to being the only, the only, the only woman, the only non-Caucasian, the only engineer. Um, over the course of my career, so I don't feel it so much anymore, but especially when I was training, um, you know, I worked hard to sort of overcome that feeling I, and prove that I belonged. Is there a, how do you bridge some of those gaps other than just your sheer impressive achievements? Is there a networking aspect to it or a trying to foster, you know, get, get more enmeshed in the community somehow? How hard is that? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think one thing that Nancy Hopkins um, and her colleagues have done um, working with the administration is really set in place a lot of policies and procedures um, to make it part of the fabric of the institution that women are included in decision making and are part of important committees, that um, they always get interviewed in proportion to the number of available candidates. And those kinds of really systematic policies and procedures are, I think, really important part of getting more women into the system. And um, I think, you know, they say that critical mass of, of women 
um, in any institution, which is around 30%, actually makes that feeling of isolation go away. We haven't reached 30% yet, <laughs> but um, I think we are, you know, we are approaching that. And certainly at the undergraduate level, we're already there. And we talked about the intensity that you found when you were here um, in your um, graduate work. How intense did you find the culture coming as a faculty member? Was there a similar level of pressure and competitiveness? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. I was thinking about this earlier. Um, there's this saying that you've probably heard from many of the folks about getting an education at MIT is like drinking water from a fire hose. And I certainly experienced that as a student. Um, you know, absolutely felt the full pressure of the fire hose and was so proud of myself for surviving in it. Surviving it. Um, and I would say now, as a faculty member, I'm kind of addicted to the fire hose. So um, you skipped this part of my bio that I went out to California uh, for to be a junior faculty member um, and then came back. And I think it's because there's really no other place like it. You know, you just, you can't step away from the, the kinds of ideas and excellence and energy and passion um, that exist here. We're glad you came back. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to be back. <laughs> um, how much, back to the work-life balance, and you have found a good balance, how much added pressure is there being in a male-dominated field to not take the personal time or not kind of focus on that balance? Is that just another added layer of, of pressure? So I think I, um, I think it kind of depends on your career stage, and not so sure how much there is external pressure, at least at the moment. I'm um, sure there has been historically, uh, but I sort of felt, I think when I was younger, when I was not tenured and not here at MIT, I think I felt, um, felt like I was being judged for how hard I was working um, because I didn't hadn't yet accomplished very much. I was just getting started. And now I think being established, I feel like I can be judged for my accomplishments and that how hard I'm working or whether I have children or how much I travel for work, I think I feel like it's not really relevant. Um, so I don't feel a lot of pressure to do more of that. I feel pressure to continue to make an impact. Um, but it seems to me that no one really cares how I, how I get there. So if I felt like I weren't funding my lab or I weren't coming up with new ideas, um, you know, then maybe I think it would matter more. And how did you end up back here as a faculty member in 2005 when you went to California? Had you always planned in the back of your mind to come back when you had left here as a student, or did you only realize what you were missing when you were on the West Coast? I think a little of both. I never really thought I would stay in California um, because I'm sort of a New England baby. My husband's from Toronto, and I think we always sort of envisioned raising a family on the East Coast. My family is still here. Um, so I thought I would come back. But Cal and so California was always kind of an experiment. But I think I didn't, I didn't, you don't realize what science is like elsewhere in the world until you leave. Um, so I did miss, I did miss it, um, and it was a real draw. I think you see these maps sometimes where they show that Cambridge is like the center of the universe. And I, I think intellectually, if you train in this environment, that is actually how you see the world, and I absolutely felt that way. And I think, I think in, um, in California what I found is that I, I had an amazing time, but I felt like I would eventually plateau in my intellectual growth. You know, I had sampled a lot of the environment. I had amazing colleagues. Um, but I had gotten so used to being here where y you could learn every moment of every day and never, ever be saturated. I mean, your, your ability to, to take it all in is the only thing that would ever limit you. You could walk down the hall and see 100 interesting talks, you know, at any given moment. And I just, I, having trained here, I'm just addicted to that. And how much did it mean to you, you mentioned how early mentors often believed in you more than yourself, and then you would finally come to that realization. How much did it mean to you when you got that first teaching position here? Yeah, I, it, meant, it meant a lot, actually. So I, um, I 
some of, you know, having some of my old professors as colleagues <laughs> was, um, was really challenging to get used to. I mean, I would still want to say, like, Professor Gerke or Professor Gray, you know, now here they were, they were my colleagues, were coming over to my house for dinner, and, you know, I have such enormous respect for them. So um, it was lovely to be recruited back by them, to have them believe, you know, in me and champion my case, and then now to have them as colleagues, I think it's just such a gift, you know. That's great. Um, how do you think men and women are different in how they approach science and medicine in your experience? Um, you know, I don't know that I, th I don't know that we are inherently different. I think, um, I think I approach things differently, but I, I can't, you know, you're inside yourself. You can't tell if it's because you're a woman or an engineer, you spent time in the clinic or, um, you know, whether you were using a hot glue gun with your five-year-old, and isn't that an interesting <laughs> material? I mean, it's hard to separate it all. Um, I think, you know, I would s I'd say in general, I think, you know, women's style of management is different, um, and mine certainly is different. I'm more of a, a leader that's a coach um, instead of, you know, a dictator, and I don't know if that's about my gender or if it's just about my personal style. But um, I think that's certainly true that my, my team runs more like a team um, than a hierarchy. And do you find yourself in the role of a mentor today to a lot of um, younger people, particularly women? I try, yeah. So I, th I, um, I try to mentor women kind of at every stage. Um, when I was here as a graduate student, I started um, an outreach organization um, called Keys to Empowering Youth. And with uh, another f few women graduate students, we all started it together. And the idea at the time, which I think actually still holds true, is that um, young girls are kind of at risk for losing interest in science and engineering in middle school. And we thought we had, you know, some of the coolest technological toys in the world sitting right here in all our labs. Wouldn't it be great to expose those young girls to those resources? Um, so what we decided to do was bring them here for a day um, for wor hands-on workshops. And then over the course of the day, they would get to meet college-age women who were themselves majoring in engineering um, and get to ask them about what's engineering, what do you want to do, and learn that there were different kinds of engineering, and get to see all these really gee whiz um, technologies that we have. And so, uh, so, we, so we started that, and um, my lab actually now serves as a host lab. So we just had a workshop um, a couple of weeks ago, um, and I brought my own girls uh, to that. So that's one way to mentor. And then I think you know we have undergraduates, so I'm the advisor to the Society of Women Engineers. So that's kind of at the college level, and we talk to them a lot about career choices and um, in engineering, even at that level, picking between industry and higher education, work-life balance. I have graduate students that I train in my own lab. Um, and postdocs. So um, I think, you know, there's a so-called pipeline for women in science engineering, and uh, the data shows really actually that it leaks all along the way. Um, so we probably need to tend to it um, at every level. And that's a wonderful effort for young girls to see labs and to see w successful women scientists. Were those, other than your parents' influence, which sounds like was <coughs> quite significant um, in exposing you to science and, and higher education. Were there opportunities like that when you were younger, or did, was science something that, you know, in schools, in the infrastructure of schools, was not really expected of young girls <laughs> to be interested yeah. in? We had, I mean, I had, um, I'm really fortunate. I went to an amazing public school where they had very strong science. I mean, didn't do a lot of science outside the classroom, but I would say, I, and we didn't, we didn't really need to. I mean, I think we were really exposed to a variety of ideas right there in the classroom. Of course, here in Boston, we also had the Museum of Science, um, which was a you know a great a great opportunity to to get more in depth in various areas. I wouldn't say that I actually found my way into science until graduate school because I was an engineer for a very long time, and then I didn't find my way into medicine until mid graduate school. 
So um, I've sort of been evolving, my passions have been evolving as I've gotten exposed to different areas. Um, and one thing I think is kind of lacking actually in the, our educational system is just the exposure of younger minds to kind of all the opportunities that are out there. I think um, people really have no idea, even after going to college, kind of all the careers that are available to them. I think you're right. People don't really, it sometimes happenstance that you stumble into careers mm -hmm. and people don't always know what's You probably there. didn't know this career existed. I didn't. <laughs> why do you think, I mean, other than that reason, which is a good one, are there other key reasons why you think more women, young women, don't choose science as a career? Yeah, so we've looked at, you know, so actually we've looked at this a lot. Um, my colleagues and I in biomedical engineering particularly, we published a paper last year kind of looking at the reasons for the leaky pipeline and it's really been studied extensively and there's no concrete sort of sound bite answer. Um, one reason for sure is that um, that role models make a difference and there are less role models. Um, and so, and, and by role models, I mean not just, you know, the number of women faculty. So in biomedical engineering, 17% of the faculty are women. Um, but to be a role model for somebody, typically for them to aspire to have your job, you know, people will sort of filter the role model through what they hope for themselves. So do you have kids? Are you married? How hard are you working? And so what you find is that, like, not even all of those 17% of women will be necessarily role models for the women coming up behind them. Um, so there's a role model effect, there's a chilly climate effect. Um, there's really interesting data on women who opt out um, having extremely high GPAs and being very successful and truly just being drawn to something else. Um, so that's sort of a problem for the profession, like why is it that people, women see other careers as more attractive or better use of their time or things that they can more fully integrate in their life. Um, I think some, some of that is PR, <laughs> actually. Um, one of the things that I try to do is to talk about, you know, what a full life I think that I have and how much I love my job, um, you know, and my family and how, you know, solutions, that, strategies that I've taken to try and make that work and to try to be really open and transparent about that. We were talking earlier about a TV program that I did where I let the cameras into my home, into my bedroom. But part of that is just to really be visible so that people can see that um, it's such an amazing job. It's true and, it, and I think it helps educate young women to see those options. Um, in addition to your lab opening its doors to young women, what do you think MIT is doing or can still do more of to buck that trend of, of young women not considering these careers? So I, you know, I think we've done a lot already. Um, we've made great strides on the faculty level, as I mentioned, so we've really increased the number of faculty women, um, which is a really important part of it. We, we certainly have lots of undergraduate women here. Um, I guess I would say we serve as an example, really, of, of excellent women, hopefully for the world. The, um, the quantitative data that were gathered as part of the gender equity report first in the 90s and in the follow-up more recently have been really, um, have have allowed MIT really to lead internationally. Lots of institutions have followed our example in terms of putting procedures and policies in place to um, institutionalize against discrimination, against bias. So I think, um, I think even our follow-up report that we published recently will, will help sort of spread that message and, and institutionalize against, against it. You have two young daughters. How do you raise them to understand that, I mean, they have great role model, obviously, mm -hmm. in, in you, but how do you raise them to understand that science is for everyone and not just the boys in their class, despite what the, their teachers or others might be um, telling them? You know, it's really interesting. So their father, my husband, Jagesh, is also a scientist. He was the, I met him here at MIT on the first day of orientation. So, um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have MIT, MIT to thank for a lot of things. and. Um, 
they they are at the age that sort of pre middle school age, which you kind of read about, where if you ask girls in a classroom if they're interested in science and math and engineering, they raise their hands just as much as the boys next to them. So it's been really interesting. So my oldest one is eight. Um, she doesn't know yet that boys and girls have different levels of interest in science. I think she's never experienced it. Just this summer, in her um, in her robot camp did she notice for the first time that there were no other girls in the class? And she's just sort of creeping up on it. But I think for her, um, that's the anomaly, you know, because there's so much science around her. And she, she sees women students over the house, and she comes to the lab, and she sees women there. So I think she thought the camp was funny um, and unusual. You know, not that her, she thinks that reality is that that both parties are equally involved. So I hope she continues to think that. Right. Maybe the trend will change and that will be the reality soon. <laughs> Maybe. I think, you know, most of the data shows that just a matter of time. It's not just a matter of time, actually, that um, you need to actively work on both gender and minority issues in engineering and science. And if you stop pushing on it, actually, the, the gains recede. Um, I think there has been a lot there's sort of the widespread view that it is just, if we just wait another generation, it's going to be okay. But the data really show that, that the, the sort of slopes of increase are, are not in that, would not support that. And what is the consequence if that doesn't change, if the trend doesn't continue to have this imbalance in the science fields? I mean, I think as a, I think it's an underutilized resource you know, for a country that's hoping to continue to be competitive. And you have to believe that the best and the brightest minds are equally distributed. So we're just not tapping the best and the brightest, you know, in very big numbers. Um, on other related issues of diversity, how do you think MIT has been doing and what, what should it aim to do over the next, over its next 150 years as it looks towards its next birthday? <laughs> So we've had, we had a, a recent task force in diversity, um, and we've made great strides on the diversity side, too. So the faculty are up from 4% to 7%. There's a lot more to do there if we really, you know, expect our institute to, for it to be inclusive and to have the faculty be diverse. I think there's, that's sort of the next phase, one of the next phases. Um, getting a little bit in more into your, um, career, um, is there anything that's keeping you up at night these days um, or anything that, or conversely, anything that gets you out of bed in the morning that you're excited to tackle that you haven't quite tackled yet? <laughs> um, yeah, so there is something that keeps me up at night, but it's like a really specific geeky thing, <laughs> which has to do with we're trying to build livers. And um, when you build a liver, the liver has 10 billion, well, we need to be able to liver with about 10 billion cells. The liver actually has about 100 billion cells, but you probably need about 10% of the liver to keep somebody alive. So I worry a lot about how we're going to build a liver that big. Right now, we can build a liver with about a million cells. <laughs> we have a few orders of magnitude to go. And on top of that, um, the livers that we're making don't have anywhere for the waste products of the liver that come out in the bile to go. So I worry a lot about how to build bigger livers and how to get rid of their waste products. And, um, you know, I, those are the kinds of things that ruminate in my mind, like new ideas to try or um, collaborators to call or, um, you know, whole new technologies that we might need to introduce to the process. Um, so, for example, progress in stem cells in just the last few years is something that impacts our work and the direction that we've gone into because, you know, we need 10 billion cells. We need cells that will grow. When you embarked on your groundbreaking work here in getting liver cells to grow outside the human, to live outside the human body, how, how supportive was the MIT family, the infrastructure, and, and why was this the right environment to launch those ideas for you? So um, this was actually the perfect environment for the kind of reason that I described earlier, which is that there's so many different activities going on right next to each other that don't necessarily relate. Um, 
that you have ideas here on this campus that you really wouldn't have in other places because you wouldn't be exposed to those ideas. So the way that project evolved is I was a graduate student in the Health Sciences and Technology program which was joint with Harvard. And it meant that my laboratory work was going on at Mass General Hospital in the lab of Mehmet Toner. And we were interested in growing liver cells um, and making them function outside the human body. And Mehmet had had the idea that if we organized them on surfaces, that they might be happier if they could be organized. And we had been, I had been trying um, for a couple of years to get the technique that he had in mind working. And my then boyfriend, now husband, was an electrical engineering student here at MIT. And at some point he said to me, kind of over dinner, you know, we have this building where they make computer chips. It's a microfabrication facility. That's all they do is pattern surfaces. And maybe you should talk to them about arranging your liver cells. And I, I literally didn't know the building existed, you know. And um, we were, we, you know, I, I marched into the MTL, the Microsystems Technology Lab, and convinced them to do one of their first biology experiments, which they'd never done before. Um, and, you know, that became the foundation of my PhD work, and my work and several other projects around that time became kind of the beginning of a field called Biomems, the fusion of biology and microtechnology. Um, and, you know, that kind of just happened because these two things bumped into each other. You had interdisciplinary collaboration going on at home as well as at it's work. true, yes. Lucky you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, and why was it so important or so helpful to be doing the work here at MIT, which is essentially the birthplace of the whole notion of nanotechnology? Well, so the, um, the facilities that are required for manipulating things on the small scale are actually um, really resource intensive. There's sort of decades of physics and engineering that have gone into creating these instruments to make our computer chips faster. Um, so the kinds of facilities we have here simply just don't exist on many academic campuses. What was it about the, the liver that, you know, f honed in your, your laser focus and, and made you want to, uh, you know, direct your efforts towards that organ versus other ones? Um, I think, you know, so I fell in love with the liver kind of by accident. Um, like the project that was pitched to me by my advisor seemed really interesting. And then as I got to know it more, I was sort of like, you know, peeling the layers of an onion. It's just it's such a fascinating organ. It has 500 functions and there's no treatment for liver failure short of transplant even now. It just seems... Um, like an exciting place to make an impact. When I started um, my first faculty position, I sort of had a decision to make about whether I would continue studying the liver or where I would take the tools that I had developed, the microfabrication tools, and kind of stamp them onto other organ systems. And the reason I kept working on the liver was really just emotional. Like, I just wasn't done with it yet. <laughs> it's just so much left um, to find out lucky for the liver that <laughs> you weren't done yet. <laughs> well, I hope so. Lucky for me. Um, wh and what is it about this field of nanobiotechnology that's so exciting and, and why you think it's really going to revolutionize how we approach medicine in the near future or how it already is? Yeah, I think, um, I think well, you know, if you look back kind of the history of really disruptive advances um, in technology and in medicine, they often happen because two fields that are mature come together. Um, and the fields of liver tissue engineering and cancer nanotechnology are like that in the sense that material scientists and engineers were developing these technological tools to make tiny things for reasons that were interesting to them, for building electronics or building stronger composites for better plastics. You know, they, there's, they were spending time and energy and building mathematical models about them for non-medical reasons. And then over here in medicine, we've been learning a lot about how cells work and how stem cells work and how to build structures out of those cells you know, using old technologies. And so when you bring them together, you have sort of all these novel tools for manipulating tiny things. The cells are about 10 microns. And receptors are on the nanometer scale. All of a sudden, you have this like you know perfect storm of tools and biology coming together. 
And since you had experience um, at other institutions before you came to MIT, how good is MIT at this interdisciplinary collaboration? Is this, is this a unique talent that this place has compared to what you've seen elsewhere? You know, I think that, um, I think some of the new models that we've put in place are really unique. So I, my lab is in a new building that's the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Biology, and it is really designed to be integrative. So we have engineers and biologists on each half of the building on every floor. Um, so it's architecturally <laughs> designed to be integrative. That, I think, is really novel. I think the notion that people need to be working across interdisciplines, d across disciplines, is, is sort of widely accepted at the moment. And people are kind of trying to figure out what the best models are to make that work. And so I think that MIT is great at experimenting. And I'm sort of part of the latest experiment, which um, you know, I hope will declare a success in a few years. Are there things going on right now in your field that to the lay person or the rest of us might seem almost like science fiction but are actually already happening or on the cusp of happening that, that gets you excited in your work? Yeah, I, um, there's a lot actually. So I would say one thing that we're really excited about is um, the idea that we could um, give patients um, an injection and inside that fluid would be little tiny particles that could circulate in your body and find a diseased tissue and take medicines specifically to that site of disease and cure it and spare the other sort of normal tissues in your body from the side effects of, for example, chemotherapy. Um, so that's one idea that um, sounds like science fiction but is actually pretty far along. Um, and a related one is an injection that could carry some sort of particle that would look all over your body um, and sample for disease so that it could diagnose disease. And so we've invented some particles recently that um, do that and um, they send out a signal that comes out in your urine. So it's sort of like a pregnancy test but for different diseases. And so again, this sort of be like you get a shot, and then it could tell you, um, you know, if you if you have a disease, if it's advanced, if it's getting better, um, and so on and so forth. Do you think the way that we treat cancer it, within your lifetime is going to be drastically different than you know what we know now? Is it the advan are the advancements that um, soon and coming? I think they are. I think. Um, uh, it takes about you know 10 to 20 years actually to get a new fundamental insight into patients. Um, there are advances that you know were made here at MIT 10 to 20 years ago that are already finding their way into the clinic. I think that cancer therapy is really on the cusp of changing. We know a lot more about it molecularly. We have new classes of therapies that target the um, molecular pathways that cancer relies on that we didn't have even five years ago. Um, and the hope is that at least some kinds of cancer would be turned more into chronic diseases um, than fatal diseases. Um, and, and that's, I think, bearing out. The other kind of science fiction-y thing that we think a lot about are kind of off-the-shelf organs. So the idea that if you have liver disease, um, instead of having to wait for a transplant, which of course means that another patient has to die, um, that you you know have a refrigerator full of organs, you could just go to the refrigerator and have an off-the-shelf liver that you could transplant into somebody. And um, you know we are making advances towards that vision. Is there another? If you did finish with the liver, which <laughs> it sounds like there's plenty more to do, um, what would be your next? Is there another next target on your, in your sights? Well, one thing that I'm really interested in, which actually still is related to the liver, is um, infectious disease. So it turns out that there's a number of organisms that infect the liver um, that are really hard to develop drugs and vaccines against. And so we're working on that a lot lately, using our ability to make human livers. But instead of making them large and thinking about implanting them, we've been making them tiny and using them for basic biology and also for drug screening. Uh, so for example, malaria actually infects the human liver, 
on the way to the blood. And most people know it for causing fever, which is what it does in the blood stage, but it actually first infects the liver, and that's where it expands tens of thousands of times. Um, and that's actually the place that people think is the best opportunity um, to kill it with drugs. Um, so drugs that are active against the liver stage of malaria are actually really scarce. So we've been trying to use our livers to grow malaria in the lab so that we could find drugs against it. And we think this is really important now because there's sort of the latest wave of efforts in malaria um, eradication. So every 30 years or so you hear about this, and so the newest phase was launched about two years ago um, by the WHO and the Gates Foundation. And so to eradicate malaria, you need to be able to get rid of all of liver stage malaria um, because there's an organism called Plasmodium vivax that can actually hibernate in your liver. So once you get a malaria infection, you have a fever, you feel better, you're still carrying these dormant forms in the liver. If we really want to eradicate malaria, we need to get rid of those dormant forms because they can re-emerge and reinfect the population. And right now we don't have any drugs against the dormant forms. We don't have any um, blood tests to see if somebody's carrying a dormant form. So we've been trying to grow. Um, it's, it's, it's called the hypnozoite because it's hypnotized in your liver. We've been trying to grow the hypnozoite um, in collaboration with the Broad Institute um, and the Gates Foundation and then see if we can find drugs against it. So that's my, I think, you know, my latest passion is thinking about how to apply our human liver work to other diseases that um, could have a broad impact. And how much of an opportunity is there for MIT to have these kind of outside partnerships, think people or places like the Gates Foundation, should they be looking for more opportunities to, to do more of that? Is that where you think innovation, you know, can really uh, be launched um, in a, and, you know, get faster results? Well, I think, um, I think science is changing. I mean, I think that even as, you know, as recent as 10 years ago, it used to be that we primarily raised our funding from the federal government. And, you know, that's changing. There's a lot more foundations in play now. There's a lot of international sources of funding. There's a lot of other governments that are interested in innovation. And so the, the whole landscape is changing. And I think MIT is evolving appropriately so. Um, to try and connect to this really fast changing environment. It's pretty clear, I think, that um, the days of just having, you know, federal funding or primarily having federal funding um, are at least, you know, are, are gone for now. The other major source is industrial funding and, you know, we're doing more and more partnerships with companies and trying to think about, um, so for example, as pharmaceutical companies stop having R&D departments, you know, how can they work with our academic environment so that we can help them innovate and they can help us innovate, um, you know, in a productive yet unconstrained way. <laughs> so those are, I think they're challenging, challenging conversations because um, they're different stakeholders than people are used to. And you yourself hold 14 um, patents or um, issued or pending patents. Um, how important is this notion of MIT putting ideas and theories into real world practice? Well, so I think it's, it's, really, it's, it's, it's really important. It's really one of the things we do best in the world. And um, the, the ecosystem that we have here, that's what Lena Nelson calls it. She's the head of our technology licensing office. It's really unique. Um, because it's not just the innovators, but it's also the investors and the entrepreneurs um, and the industrial base that we have all around us. Just, just looking at Cambridge since I was a graduate student has changed completely. And that kind of ecosystem really helps to take an idea, in, you know, a publication, a patent, and push it out into the world, into a product or a startup or a license. In addition to your, your groundbreaking work with the liver, can you relate some other key moments in your career where you thought, you know, I'm really making an impact here or, or, or changing the way medicine is going to evolve for society? 
one of their <laughs> aha moments where all those advanced degrees and all the hours in the lab seemed worth it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would say, um, so we've had a few, in the liver we've had more, uh, we've had a couple of aha moments on the infectious disease side. So we, um, last year, in collaboration with Rockefeller University, we showed that we could infect the liver cells that we were growing with hepatitis C virus, which hadn't been done. And um, the liver cell is the place that hepatitis C goes in your body. And again, it's been a really hard virus to study because people couldn't infect the real cell that gets infected. So that was a great you know, breakthrough moment. And it happened, I think, um, because we had a fantastic graduate student and a great collaborator. And he built on you know, years of work that we'd already done making these livers more liver-like. Um, and then just this year, we showed that we could establish the same kind of platform for the human malarias, which, again, had never been done. Um, so that's been really exciting. And I, I got to debut the work at the malaria meeting in uh, December, which I'd never been to before, never been invited to before. And the community was you know, really welcoming. And I sort of had that sense that it was well overdue that bioengineering was part of the tropical medicine community. You know, it was just like a whole sort of breadth of technology that they hadn't had access to. It was really fun to be kind of part of that conversation. And um, what do you think, with your unique knowledge of having been a student here and a faculty member, what are some things about this institution that you think would, people would be surprised to learn? Having you've been had the inside track on both, <laughs> from both perspectives. Hmm. <laughs> or maybe <laughs> myths that aren't true, or. I, I actually don't know what would be surprising about MIT. I think that. The one thing that was surprising to me as I got to know the faculty better was how many of them who are, you know, just the pinnacle of their field and complete thought leaders um, still really do have, have full lives. So um, my department head in electrical engineering um, up until last year, he just turned over, used to leave at 3 o'clock in the summer to coach his son's soccer game. You know, and I think we'll be surprised to know that. Like we. Um, you know, we're not just thought leaders all the time. <laughs> That's good. That, and you're leading the way in that, for sure. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, and how different do you feel like MIT is today from when you first arrived? You said, you mentioned some of the changes in Cambridge with some of the companies and things sprouting up, but on this campus, have you seen much change? Well, certainly, I think, you know, we're building like crazy the physical, um, the physical campus has changed so much. So the building that my lab is currently in is um, didn't exist until a year ago. And the quad that it sits on, which is this beautiful green space, was a parking lot full of lunchtime trucks. So um, we're growing and expanding and building new state-of-the-art facilities. And um, it's really, it's, it's mind-boggling. There's a new media lab. There's a new Sloan School. It's just physically changed. And I think intellectually, it just it just keeps growing and evolving. So I'm not sure that it's a change. It's just going a million miles an hour, and it's still going a million miles an hour. It's lovely to have a woman president uh, with a life science background, and you know, it's it's lovely to experience the changes on the faculty that so many people worked so hard for. It's nice to have women colleagues. Those are important changes. Professor Bhatia, what exciting new cancer therapies are, are you and your colleagues working on that could drastically change medicine in the near future? So one idea that we're really excited about is um, an idea I kind of alluded to earlier, where you would um, try and target chemotherapy just to the tumor. Um, but a version of it that we're excited about is one wherein when you give an injection, we estimate that it's about 10 to the 13th particles that would be given in a typical injection. So working with a graduate student, Jeff von Moltzon, a few years ago, we sort of thought about, well, all of those particles don't have to be exactly the same. 
And at the moment, that's how people had been designing them. That each particle in that solution should try and find the tumor and home in on it and carry the chemotherapy. We started thinking about how the particles could be different. And maybe they could talk to each other. Or maybe they could cooperate. And so one could find the tumor, and then it could send a signal, and it could recruit another particle. And then the other particle would just listen to the first one. And it could carry the chemotherapy. And so we think about these as cooperating systems of nanoparticles. Um, we were inspired by some natural systems that have sort of natural swarming behavior, like bees or ants searching for food. So sort of each component of the system doesn't have to be too smart, but they have this sort of collective behavior. So this is an area that we've recently gone into, and we built our first kind of cooperative nanosystem last year. And it was able to carry 40 times more drug into the tumor than the uncooperating <laughs> system. And so recently I've hired a computer scientist, a postdoctoral person who, who actually studies swarming robots. Um, we're trying to come up with ideas for how to program these little nanobots to swarm inside your body. So that's an area that we're really excited about. And that does sound to no most people like science fiction, but it's, it's, it's yeah. coming. It's coming, like yeah. Um, and you mentioned earlier that you try to always keep the patient in mind and you want to work on um, breakthroughs that really impact the patients. Is that ever hard to do in the lab when you're sort of immersed in the task at hand? Or is that something that people here at MIT are good at, that again, that theory into practice? You know, how is this going to change lives idea of innovation? So I think it is something that we naturally do at MIT, is to sort of pick our heads up every once in a while and look around and think like, OK, how am I going to get this out into the world? And I would say that's kind of how it works for us. We try hard to come up with really brand new ideas and not initially be constrained um, in how to make them deployed in a patient someday. So we try to do work that inspires us and might inspire others. And then somewhere along the way, when it's working, we sort of take a step back and say, like, OK, but for this really to take go to the next level, we need to simplify it, or we need to make it out of some other material, or we need a different partner. Um, so for us, it kind of happens like that in steps. You know, So we try and have the inspirational idea, and then try and kind of morph it into something that could actually get out there. And do you think, is there some secret to what makes MIT this kind of place that encourages such outside-the-box thinking, such revolutionary ideas, big ideas, you know, not small innovations, but really, you know, they're famous for their life-changing um, innovations across all walks of life? So I think it's the people, and I think it's the people that are here and the people that continue to come here for, and I think people come here for all kinds of reasons, but mostly it's the people and the ideas and, um, and enabling those ideas. Um, so I don't know that it's, it's a secret, it's just um, you know, a special collection of a thousand faculty and all of the, continually all of the sort of best and brightest minds that are drawn here. And what do you enjoy most about your work here? So I really, I really love nothing more than sitting around with a bunch of um, uh, colleagues, either in my lab or you know in their own labs, um, brainstorming. You know, I just for me that's absolutely the most fun thing to think about, um, either connecting this technology with that technology or starting with a medical problem and you know being at the whiteboard thinking about how we might attack it. Um, for me, that's absolutely the funnest part of my job. It sounds like there aren't probably many moments where someone says, we can't do this, or that's not possible. Is that even in the lexicon here? <laughs> not often. <laughs> that's good. Um, what, do you f what would you like to see MIT accomplish in its next 150 years? I know that's a big span of time, but you know, if, the, if, the, um, if the institution were to sort of have a set of principles or, or things that it wanted to accomplish, what do you think those should be? What areas? So I think that, you know, technology in the service of humanity is the thing that I love about MIT. And I think we have sort of the global challenges of our time, um, you know, climate change and energy and human health and um, 
I would hope that we play a huge role in impacting those peace and prosperity and justice. <laughs> and in your own field, you know, when you get to the point where you're looking back on your career and your time here at MIT, what, what do you hope, what legacy do you hope you will have left? So, you know, I'm hoping that, that our work will really impact human health, either directly by making inventions that go into people or making tools that make better drugs that go into people. Um, but I also hope that indirectly, that by you know the trainees that um, come through my group, that that they go on to you know spread our way of thinking and innovating um, into the world, and the students that come through my classroom that you know, they go on to impact the world. So I I think we both through my research work and through the educational work that we do, hopefully we can you know inspire the next generation. And if there was one thing about MIT that you know now that you didn't know when you came here as a graduate student that you wish someone had told you, what would that be? That I belonged. And I absolutely feel that now, you know, that I, that I belong here. And um, I think I didn't know that right away. Do you think a lot of students here, uh, particularly undergrads, probably feel that every day? And, and how, how can they be reminded <laughs> that they also belong? Well, I think, you know, when I first learned about there's this thing called the imposter syndrome, which they say um, women of often feel, but I think, truthfully, everybody feels it, and that's that feeling that, like, you're an imposter, that you don't belong, that someone's going to find you out, you're not really as knowledgeable about the thing that you are supposed to be an expert in. When I first found out about that, I was like, so relieved because <laughs> I had felt that, you know, my whole career, like, somehow I wasn't quite good enough or I didn't know as much as I should, or somebody would find the one hole in my argument. And so I think just being honest about that, being, you know, that all these incredible minds, they, everybody feels that way. Everybody gets nervous um, when they're standing on a platform. I think um, if the undergrads knew that more, that it would be helpful. And I read that you sometimes have a little secret getaway to go to the movies by yourself to de-stress and decompress. Why is that so important to have that time and maybe have that place, especially here at MIT where it's, you know, can be pretty high pressure. Yeah, so I think I was saying earlier that, you know, you sort of need to, you need to tend to your spirit and you have to kind of find for yourself what those moments are. And for me, it's, you know, cinema therapy <laughs> or getting my toes done or for what, but, you know, for someone else it might be a different thing and I think I think that you know the creative mind needs tending it's really important not just to you know work it to the bone and if you weren't in the career you have now what do you think you'd be doing I think that um, I might have been an architect um, because I really do love that fusion of creativity and technology um, of you know quantitative approaches and building things. Um, so I, I kind of always had that itch. Maybe I would have been an architect. <laughs> Any favorite architectural spots on campus? Well, so many. Um, I love the, the State of Building, of course, which is the Geary Building and the IMP. And um, we have, I think, actually also a, r a really lovely collection of sculpture, um, which I enjoy. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Likewise.